Hi, everybody. I'm so glad that you've joined us today. It's always good to be with you at these Hope for Mental Health community events. It's so hard to believe, but we are almost at the end of 2021. And as I look back um, over the people that we've interviewed here this past year, the lineup has just been stellar. We started with Dr. Dan Allender and Rachel Clinton Chen, um, Dr. Aaron Cariotti, Megan Greider, Dr. Anita Phillips, Dr. Bruce Perry with his fantastic new book, Dr. Javier Amador, Jamie Grace, Sarah J. Robinson with her amazing book. And each one of these speakers um, is an expert in their field and, and they have written movingly about trauma or depression, recovery, schizophrenia, chronic suicidality, or they have a compelling story of their own of lived experience. And if you missed any of these events this year, please go back and watch them. I know you'll be so glad that you did. I'm really excited that this month, my friend and ministry colleague, Joy Herlow, will be speaking with Constance Rhodes about a subject that just doesn't get enough attention in the world of mental health challenges. But both of these women have struggled with eating disorders and they know firsthand the pain, the cost, and what recovery looks like. I confess that I really have not known a whole lot about eating disorders, didn't realize how common they were or even how deadly they can be. But what I have learned is that most people um, like me, if you don't know this, you probably don't know that up to 20% of people who have an untreated eating disorder will die. But with treatment, the rate falls to two to 3%. I didn't know that 24 million people in the United States are affected by eating disorders. But what I do know is that nearly every one of us is impacted by diet culture and disordered eating. So this subject is not just a random affects a few people. This is a subject that really impacts every one of us. I know you're gonna enjoy this conversation and I'd like for you to join me in welcoming Joy and Constance. Constance, it is so wonderful to be with you today. Um, I feel so privileged to get to talk with you. Um, about 13 years ago, I started my eating disorder recovery journey, and God has just used you at steps all along the way, um, whether it's through books that you've written, conferences you've spoken at. Um, we've had the opportunity to get together a few times, and it's just been such an incredible gift to get to know you and to see the way that God has moved in your life. And so I feel really honored to get to talk with you today and for our audience to get to hear from you. So thank you so much for being with us. Oh, you bet. I'm glad to do it. Yeah. So to start off with, I'd love for you just to share a little bit about your story and about who you are with all the people who are with us today. Sure. Well, um, I'm here in Nashville, Nash Vegas of the country, and I've been here a long time, actually originally moved here to pursue a career as a recording artist, which didn't actually happen. Um, but my journey, a lot of, especially what we'll talk about today started when I was very young. My mom had battled food issues at the time. And of course I didn't know way back then that that would come to play such a big role in my life. But I remember being young and watching her always on a diet. And, and I remember some pretty intense moments at home. She later developed really a full blown eating disorder that was, very visible to all of us in the home. I remember just a lot of trauma associated with watching my mom navigate food issues. And, you know, when you're young, you don't really know what that is. I remember being a teenager, becoming more aware of what she was doing. And, you know, she would, she would go out and eat huge amounts of food and she'd come home and she'd get rid of it all in the bathroom. And I remember just being really confused and thinking, you know, don't you know that you're, you're hurting yourself, you know? And so then I went to college. I know, you know, so much of my story, but for those who don't, I went to college when I was 16. So kind of young, I went to a small Bible college. I was really lonely and kind of in over my head being on my own at that time. And and not knowing much about like how to prepare my own food or how to buy my own groceries and seeing lots of foods I wasn't allowed to have when I was growing up because of my mom's own issues. I just, I started eating a lot, not really thinking about it. And in those first couple of months at college put on what never was talked about way back then, which was the freshman 15. And I found myself surprisingly 
in this battle with food that I had never expected to have food, food and weight had never been an issue for me. And now all of a sudden I was feeling, you know, fat and ugly. Um, I should clarify that I wasn't those things, but that is how I was feeling. And, you know, that would set me on a path that became over a decade of disordered eating. And I kind of swung the gamut, like lots of people do from, you know, really rigid and maybe losing weight to, to binging and gaining more and then getting scared and going on a diet and maybe losing some, but then getting hungry and eating more, you know, just this whole cycle that began to be really very consuming for me. And, you know, those 10 years, I would probably split into kind of two buckets that maybe we can talk about the first three and a half. I think of those years, I was still in college and I felt very consumed and trapped, uh, in a binge eating disorder was probably what mostly characterized that time. And then I kind of got a grip on the binging. And as the weight came back to what was normal for me, I entered another seven years of just chronic dieting, borderline anorexia, not quite there. And all of that time together, you know, it was 10 years later, looking back, realizing I have a life controlling issue that I need to do something about. Wow. That is, um, yeah. Thank you for sharing. It's, it's really powerful to hear the way that it started so young for you seeing, you know, eating disorders in your home. And then, um, for a while, not feeling like that was maybe your story, more your mom's, but then when it was like, okay, and then then it became part of your story of personally struggling. Um, yeah, that is just really, really powerful to hear. And I know everybody's story is different, but I, I, you know, I wonder just even the people who are joining us today, some people may know everything about eating disorders and other people might know almost nothing. So I I heard you say a couple of different things about, you know, binge eating and, you know, borderline anorexia. Can you kind of define what are some typical eating disorders and what does that, you know, kind of how does that play out and what does that look like? Sure. It used to be back in the day uh, that there were only three that people would talk about Um, anorexia, bulimia, And then binge eating disorder kind of came on the scene. And what listeners should understand if they don't is it really is a continuum. And so to meet clinical criteria for a clinical eating disorder, anorexia, bulimia, or binge eating disorder, there's a whole list of things that you got to do, you know? So for anorexia, for example, one of the criteria that I didn't meet Um, is that you have to lose your period for a while if you're female. And, um, you know, there's different parameters. If it's, if it's bulimia, you know, you, you've got to be binging and purging X amount of frequency and things like that. Um, but there are, you know, clinical, you can find them online. You can find them at findingbalance.com. We have all of them listed and you can see what those clinical criteria are. And a lot of people might not ever meet all of those criteria. And so they may end up being like I was, where I would say, I know I have issues with food, but I'm not meeting any of these criteria of these different disorders. And so I think I'm all right. And what I began to learn, and this is a long time ago now, I came upon what's been renamed now, but at the time they called it EDNOS, eating disorders, not otherwise specified. Now they call it OSFED or some other name. Um, but the, the idea is that you don't actually have to meet all those criteria to have food issues that warrant attention. And so some things I would say that you want, we want to look out for is, am I always on a diet? You know, am I afraid to eat? If I eat, do I immediately have feelings of fear and remorse and anger at myself? Maybe do I withhold from food when I am hungry? Um, Do people tell me they're concerned because I'm either not eating enough or maybe I'm, you know, eating large amounts. Do I eat? Do I hide when I eat? (laughs) Am I trying to, to eat away from others? Do I spend when I wake up in the morning is my first thought, what did I eat last night and how am I going to make up for it today? And, you know, really it's a lot of things that are just very common today. Of course, you know, the term diet culture, it's just a very normalized process that people believe nowadays it's just normal. You just always worry about what you eat. You're always on a diet. You always hate your body. You can sit down at a table with others, especially females and complain about your bodies. And this 
truly is actually not the way that we were originally designed to live. Yeah. Yeah. Diet culture, I feel like is such a common, um, it's so common for people to always be on another diet or to try a new eating program or a new food plan or different things like that. Um, what, what, can you explain a little bit of just what the, I feel like there's, there's so many times where, yeah, if people look at the criteria of eating disorders and they think, well, I don't fit that. I mean, that's what I did. I thought I didn't fit that. So I was fine. Um, but at a certain point, it's like, can you talk about just that slippery slope? Like what, what do people need to be aware of? And, and what is it like, that's not how we're intended to live. So like, what is, what is the, how are we intended to live? Yeah. Well, one, um, comparison I'll make that or parallel really that I'll make that may help some of the listeners is, uh, I love listening to you guys like Dave Ramsey. And so he'll say something like debt is normal. Be weird. Okay. And, and truly debt and consumerism is cultural. We have, we do tend to believe, you know, we can get it now pay later. We've really assumed that mindset. And so many, many, many people's resources are tied up in debt. They can't give the way they want to, and they can't even get the things they need sometimes because they've misallocated their funds. Um, but it's normal and it's easy to do. And people will even cheer you on when you do it. Right. Okay. So if you want to overlay that on the food thing, so it's really normal to, to hate, uh, our weight to, you know, think that we've eaten the wrong thing, that food is good or bad. Oh, I, I mean, this is so common, right? You're out to lunch with someone and they say, oh, I'm being a bad girl today and I'm going to have this item, you know, and this item is on their bad food list. And so we moralize uh, food items. So cookies, bad salad, good. Right. And so when we're doing that, then we're, we're living, whether we think about it or not, this internal message, I ate the cookie, I'm bad. I ate the salad, I'm good. We begin to kind of equate our righteousness and sometimes our value to what it is that we are eating and how we feel about it. And then, you know, if you add the issue of weight to that, so if I weigh more, I'm bad. If I weigh less, I'm good. And so in a way, the scale becomes God in our lives. You know, whatever number the scale says is what's going to determine who I am and how righteous on some level, you know, how righteous or good that I am. And then you can, again, it's a continuum. So there are people who think that way, but they get on with their lives and they're able to be in relationships and health, healthy ways. They're able to eat a variety of foods. They may not feel that great when they do, but then they just kind of, you know, watch it the next day. But then sometimes, like you said, that slippery slope, now it's like, oh no, I ate this yesterday. So today I'm not going to eat anything. And then can come that feeling of, Ooh, I got through a whole day with not eating anything. Let me see if I can do another one. Or on the other side, you know, with different food choices or going on that binge, binging on food to me is also greatly parallel to overspending. That actually happens to be an area I have to resist. I can go into a store and think, oh, I really shouldn't buy that, but I really want it. And then I begin to fantasize in my mind about how great it's going to make me feel to have whatever that item is. And in the binge, sometimes some of that's going on too. It's like, especially in COVID, we saw eating issues increase 80%, eight zero percent. We had a lot of loneliness in COVID. So a lot of, well, if I eat this, this will make me feel better. Or if I restrict, this will make me feel, you know, this, this whole kind of daily life beginning to be structured around what we're eating or not eating. And then our belief about who we are and our value, depending on what we eat or what we don't eat or what we weigh or what we don't weigh. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I feel like there's so many times where people talk about, um, they talk about eating disorders as if it's like a diet gone wrong, you know, where it's like, okay, well, you just, you just went too far in that diet. But can you talk a little bit about what that, like, I've, I've heard you also talk about kind of disordered eating and eating disorders and the, the difference between, but like, can you share that with our audience of just the numbers that you share on that are shocking to me. And I just, I find it really, 
Yeah. Well, and the numbers are probably different now. Yeah. Uh, one study that I've quoted for years now, but it was done quite some time ago, what found that three out of four women had some kind of food issue. Um, now, again, post a very interesting time in, in history, uh, and also with um, constant obsession with food and weight being normalized, mm-hmm. I would think those numbers could be higher. And you know, what we're really wanting to move toward is where I can eat when I'm hungry, I can stop when I'm full, I can get on with my life. I'm not always living in terror that, you know, my clothes won't fit today because I ate a little too much last night. I'm not saying no to social events because they're not serving something that's safe to me or because I don't look the weight I wish I did. So I'm I'm not going to go to that wedding or I'm not going to go to that reunion or I'm not going to be in a photo with my family because I feel really fat right now. And so I'm just going to wait. And you see a lot of people just putting life on hold and waiting for perfect. You know, when I get this weight under control or this diet under control, then I'll feel like I can, you know, go maybe be in a relationship or maybe I can serve God better uh, because, you know, he's probably really disappointed in me because I have this struggle over here. And there's all these different ways that people put life on hold. And so uh, to me, just to be clear, I think it's great. And I try to eat mindfully. So, you know, I no longer binge. I can totally eat pizza, cake, cookies, whatever, you know, things that used to be off limits to me or binge foods before. Now that it's been, uh, gosh, it's been, has it been like 20? So I just turned 50, which is weird. So it's been at least 20 years. (laughs) It's been 20 years of a journey for me, right? And so in the beginning of my journey, I had to say no, maybe to some foods that would trigger me to binge today, I can eat those foods. It's not a trigger. Um, but then I'm also very likely to eat in moderation and to not overdo it. And there's nothing wrong with that. The question is how much mind space is this taking up for me? And am I able to move on if I've eaten things, even if I feel like I really did overeat, which I do sometimes on holidays or whatever, am I able to move on and not be drowning in this downward spiral of unhealthy behavior. Okay. So how did you get there? You know, from the like early days of starting to realize, like, even I feel like both of us talked about that because we didn't meet all the criteria, we kind of convinced ourselves that we were okay, even though we weren't. Um, How did you, how did you start to realize like, maybe I need to get some help and, and start to realize start to take the steps. Like what steps did you, did you take in that? Yeah. So I outlined some of this. If someone really wants the full story, I have a book called life inside the thin cage. You can see it back there. Um, it's really and great. In there I, I do... highly recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> so I, you know, I wrote that book. Actually, I remember thinking when I was writing it, am I ready to write this yet? Cause I was very new coming out of it. I'm glad that I wrote it then because Honestly, I was just so much more in touch with that struggle than certainly 20 years later, you know, Uh, but to answer your question, one of the first things, well, the first thing was to admit there was a problem. And I know you've heard me talk about this, but I really, I really um, had denied it to myself, but my father had talked me into going to the doctor. He was concerned because my weight just kept just a little bit, a little bit lighter each time he saw me. And that doctor gave me a diagnosis of anorexia and I was very like devastated. Um, I immediately, in my head, I knew the criteria better than she did because most general practitioners don't really know all those criteria. So I, I knew, I knew that I I had a choice. I could sort of disregard her diagnosis on a technicality, or I could admit that if some doctor thought there was enough going on to write that on that paper maybe I should do something about it. And of course, you know the story, but I, it was a pivotal moment for me to sit down in there in my car in the parking lot and admit to myself, to the air (laughs) around me, I have an issue here. And it was in that same moment that I, I knew I wasn't ready to give up really what was borderline uh, anorexia for me at that point in time. I, I was terrified to give it up. I was sure that I would lose my job in the record business. That's where I worked at that time. If I gained one pound, you know, I had all of these 
thoughts in my head about how important it was for me to maintain this level of control. But I had remembered in that moment when I was younger at church one time, someone said, you just have to be willing to be willing. And I know you've heard me share this before, but because it's such the wimpy prayer, but I, it truly was like, Lord, I don't want to give this up. So please make me willing to be willing to maybe consider thinking about <laughs> giving this up. Like it really was that far from yes, but it was still a step forward. And I know that you, you guys know this from all the beautiful work you've done in recovery of all kinds over the years there at Saddleback. It really is that one next thing, like the one step forward really does make a difference. And I remember in the beginning thinking, you know, how do I get from, I'm terrified to gain an ounce really to, yeah, I'd be okay if I even gained, you know, anything at all, five, let's say five pounds. Right. And I remember a friend said to me, it's really just the next step at a time. And he even said to me, and I found this helpful. Um, he was like, so why don't you just try gaining a few pounds and see what happens? And I remember thinking, oh, well, maybe, maybe I could try that, you know? Um, and it was a, a series of small steps. Other key things I will tell you, I did reach out to find someone to talk to. And I was very surprised that as I began to share about it, lies I believed, I began to recognize that they were lies. And that's what happens when we have someone else to talk to. Um, that can be a counselor. That can be a friend who knows what they're talking about. <laughs> Sometimes a friend or parent is maybe not the best person, so you can really feel that out. And then another huge, huge thing for me that later went on to influence a lot of the work we did at Finding Balance was... Um, I went to a group and I know that y'all at Saddleback know the importance of that. Right. And there was that shared community. I am not the only person in the room who has issues. It was both humbling and empowering at the same time. And so I'm a huge believer in continued community and relationship wherever you are in life, whatever you're walking through, never, never, never to walk alone. Okay, so I'm gonna since we're talking about groups and and all of that, I'm just gonna skip ahead a little bit to what are some groups that you that you know of if people are like you talked a little bit about finding balance, so we'll put that in the chat. Um, Celebrate Recovery is also great um, all around the country, so we'll put that in the chat as well. But are there other groups that you recommend, or how do you recommend people find a good group? Yeah, so unfortunately, there aren't a lot of Christ-centered groups, um, so those who are looking for that. Uh, Living in Truth Ministries has a group. So we do, we know that gal and we like what she does. Um, Rock Recovery, who I think you may be familiar with out there on the East Coast. Uh, they actually use Finding Balance's Lasting Freedom materials to offer a Christian group. And they also have another new idea, uh, new ID uh, is a Christian material-based group. Um, we're waiting to see more come forward in that space. And then I know plenty of people, and I know you probably do as well, who've also been beneficially helped by going to groups that may not be Christian per se, but they are providing good leadership. You know, the groups are well run, the sharing is healthy. And so I have learned to, to not be a full snob <laughs> and to know that, that God can be present in so many different places. And so, you know, there are some places where um, OA groups, are really well run. There are other ones that you may not feel, and that could be true of any group, honestly, any of the ones we've mentioned. If you have good leadership, you have great groups. And if you don't have good leadership, you don't have a great group. But the important thing is to go try and, and just try, like engage with others. And then if you begin to feel like either you've, you've received all that you could through that, but you're stuck, then I would say, then you ask God, show, show me where to go next. I believe he knows for sure where each person needs to go. It does feel kind of like a huge universe of what do I do out there? Um, certainly if you go to findingbalance.com's website, we also try to keep a listing there as we become aware of more groups, certainly in the Christ-centered space. Great. Great. Thank you. Yeah. I, I feel like groups are just so helpful to be able to verbalize and hear other people process their journey as well. Um, for me, it was just helpful to be able to learn more about, um, you know, even to identify my feelings was a huge part of the journey for me. Um, and then just, it was so helpful to be able to sit around a room or a table or a circle of chairs and just 
hear somebody else talk about something. It was like, even in those spaces at times, God would like speak to me through that. And so I am a firm believer in groups and love that. So your, your finding balance groups are incredible. And I was really so grateful that um, our church started one right when I was coming out of recovery or right as I was coming out of treatment. And so it was just a great, very helpful step for me. Yeah. And you know, your listeners should know. So finding balance doesn't currently offer groups anymore, but we took all of that curriculum and it's about a year's worth of study material and uh, it's available for people to use. So we really encourage people, you know, even if you can't find a group anywhere, maybe do this curriculum with a friend or maybe ask a few people at your church if you can do that. And the nice thing about what we've created is we know that it's good <laughs> and we've even created leader materials to really help equip. And so I guess that goes back to, I think it's always just important when you're in a group anywhere, just make sure it feels healthy to you and that you, you are growing. Um, and don't also just go just to receive, like you're there to give into that experience like everyone else. And I think that's another key thing that sometimes we forget when we're entrenched in a struggle of our own, you know, we feel like we have nothing to give, but the truth is, like you said, you heard somebody maybe share something in a particular group meeting and that spoke to your heart. And so we need to always remember that is it doesn't even matter if we are wrestling with some something, every single person you see anywhere on any stage is wrestling with something, yeah. but that doesn't mean that God can't use us. And so let's all be mindful of there's a bigger picture here than even this one thing that we're trying to wrestle through. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I think those are the times too of like, I would push myself to share every time because I was like, I'm here to get better. And so this is part of the process is sharing. So yeah, I love, I love that you said that because everybody does learn from each other and we all have something to give. So I think that that's part of, um, part of the process is seeing that like there's ways that God works in our stories in the, in even times where, we don't see how that could be helpful to somebody. It's like, okay, well it, it is. And, and God, it's, it's up to God to use that, you know? And so um, the willingness to take the next step. And I've thought about your phrase of being willing to be willing, you know, so many times. And I just think that that's so applicable. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, okay. If people are worried about a loved one that, um, you know, eating disorders and eating issues, it's, it's easy to explain a way of like, oh no, I'm just cutting this out or even using doctors, you know, and kind of saying, well, my doctor said that I shouldn't eat this or, you know, all the different things. If you're worried about somebody, how do you start those conversations of trying to help them maybe realize that they need help or what advice can you give to loved ones um, who are listening today, worrying yeah. about somebody? Oh, that's super hard, isn't it? Because you and I have both been in the seat of um, complete denial. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure for you, it certainly was true for me. There were times when it just didn't matter what someone said to me. I was quite settled and happy <laughs> with what I was doing. Um, and so I guess my first thing I would say is just, just remember there's a powerful hold of lies uh, in, in intertwined with any addiction. Um, just remember, so you're not just fighting against, um, a, you're not fighting against a person at all. Remember, there's a huge spiritual component. Uh, if, if you, uh, wherever you stand on faith, most people believe in good and evil, and there is just a, an, an, an evil agenda against each, each one of us. Right. And so, when a person is in an addictive cycle, they are listening to a lot of lies. Sometimes those lies say, this cycle is great and I love it. Okay, that was the case for me. That's the case maybe for those who are successful <laughs> at you know their food issues. Successful meaning, oh, they feel like they've got this under control, which isn't most people, but some do feel that way. Another lie is if you admit this problem, everyone's going to be disappointed in you and they're going to leave. And so that motivates a lot of denial. It's like, you know what? I don't even want to admit this to myself because if I admit it to myself, it's like, I'm saying 
I, everyone's going to leave me and, and I'm the reason why. So, so that lie, fear and shame, you know, these things and control and then pride, all of these, these are really what we're wrestling against, not the food itself. So I first say, be mindful. <laughs> There's a lot going on, a lot of lies going on that are going to convince that person that you love that they need to keep doing what they're doing. Okay. The second thing is to know that leading with care uh, versus judgment is always the way to go. So when my dad did say to me, you know, honey, I'm, I'm just, I care about you and I'm concerned. That was way more powerful than sometimes you might hear. You're not eating enough or you need to eat more, you know, those kinds of things, or you need to eat less. I'm sorry. That's the other side of that. Um, those kinds of statements just cause that person's walls to go up. Whereas, Hey, I'm really curious. You know, that's another great thing. Curious. I'm really curious about how you eat. I've, I've noticed, you know, that you seem not to be eating very much, or I've noticed that you seem to be eating um, a lot more than you used to, or you seem to have funny feelings about food. You know, you're noticing something and you're curious. Those are very, um, those are somewhat gentler ways to go about it. Now, if you are caring about someone who is a minor, you have a little bit more opportunity and should step in a little more strongly. Like if they're, if it's your child and they're still living with you, um, now is the time anyway to nip this thing in the bud. And so I think still sharing, um, the care, the concern and being curious, those are all good things, but also you, you ought to be the parent, right? And you're going to say, Hey, I feel like there's something really worth looking into here. How about we go to a counselor together? And if they're fighting that, but you're also seeing significant concerns for unhealth, you can, you can and should fight back and it feels terrible. You're going to feel like the bad guy, but maybe that's what you have to be for a period of time. If that's the case, I highly recommend you need to be getting support. In any case, you may be married to someone with a food issue. You may have a sibling that you're really concerned about. You may have a good friend that you're really concerned about. You should go and get the support you need as well because you can't give what you don't have. And so you could even go to counseling to wrestle with your feelings about what you're concerned about with your friend. And then you can share with them, you know, that you've done that. All of those things will help, I think, to, to bring down the guard that may be up, um, and then you just invite God into it. He's there anyway, but remember he's the savior, ultimately not you. And so asking him for wisdom about your next steps and being humble and taking them wherever he leads you. I think those are really key things as well. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, um, there's so many times that when I'm talking to different people that I love, um, there'll be times where I think so many people don't realize how serious eating disorders are. And so I think sometimes, you know, I, I see people kind of be like, well, it'll get better, you know, but what's your experience in that? Like, what have you seen in that space? It is, you used the, the, the phrase earlier, slippery slope, and that's what it is, right? So no, not everyone who has food issues is going to die from their food issues. Lots of people don't. But in every case, the quality of life begins to diminish. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, fertility is affected. And um, even the ability to be in a healthy relationship is affected. And of course, the health can be very affected. You know, hair can fall out, periods can stop, osteoporosis can begin. And then more and more co-morbid um, things can happen, right? Co-occurring things. So somebody is you know, intent on not eating. And so they take up smoking or they start to drink. And then that leads to binging. There can be a lot of these things that begin to go together. And so I think what we want to do is always think, you know what, anything, any step we take toward an unhealthy behavior has the potential to lead us down an ultimately terrible, terrible road that if it doesn't end in physical death will end in the death of other things, dreams, relationships, um, possibilities, opportunities. And so it is important to step in. And if you have concern, especially, uh, about somebody's, you know, they're, they're blacking out. Uh, I, that happened to me all the time. I would take a shower and start to see spots, you know, and go lay on the bed after the shower and try and 
I didn't even realize how dangerous that was. Like my heart could have stopped. My electrolytes were probably super low, but again, I was on that fringe. So if I'd gone to the doctor, they might've said, oh, you don't really have an eating disorder. But if you see that person and you have that concern, or if you are that person and you're seeing those alarming signals, your body is trying to tell you something and you want to go do something about it. Let me just say, we talked about this before we came on today. There's so much more life out there beyond this. Mm -hmm. Let's not forget that there's mm -hmm. there, while you're going to focus on this, there's so much more life. And so sometimes we got to go look at that and let that be your incentive to do the hard work, to make the better choices, to live well and walk in freedom. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I'm excited for you to share a little bit um, here in, in a little bit of just what, how God has opened up new doors for you and just kind of what the, what the future looks like. But before that, I wanted to just circle back around real quick to, you were talking about parents and, you know, parents that have minors um, that, um, you know, their kids are under 18. There's been a lot in the news about eating disorders lately and, you know, the impact of social media, you're a parent, like what, what would you share as far as just for parents that are worried about their kids and what that looks like, what, what words of advice do you have for them? Yeah. So if you're talking about how do we help protect our kids against yeah. the influences of social media and all of that, is that the question? Yeah. Social media, or even just the ways that, you know, there's been different things about how, um, you know, when, when, um, teenagers, young teenagers are on, you know, Instagram or social media. There's just a lot of different um, ways that they've been seeing that that has been impacting eating disorders. And right. so for parents who are trying to figure out how do they, how do they help protect their kids? How do they have these conversations with their kids? If they're worried about their kids um, and some of the people that they're following, how would you encourage parents to have those conversations and kind of enter into that space? Yeah, well, you're totally right. And we know that social media 100% contributes to loneliness and loss of self-esteem among a hundred other probably negative things, right? So yeah. we know that. Yeah. Um, and I do wrestle with it for my kids. I have three kids and the youngest is a girl. So I've always been really mindful in particular about her and about what she sees. Mm -hmm. I have learned and had to accept that I cannot control what she's going to see out there. And I hate that I have to accept that, but it's simply, I, I find very few parents who feel that they actually can control that because these kids are walking around with these devices in their pockets and we're not with them all the time. And I know it's not realistic for me to be able to prevent her from seeing all the things she's going to see. So then it goes to what you just said, how do we help protect? So here's a couple of key things that parents need to know. Um, number one is I believe I'm not sure because I haven't seen a recent study, but I can tell you that a few years ago, we did a poll on our website and we found that still the influence of home carried strong weight. Okay. So what parents or siblings or close relatives said about food and weight in our poll, it carried stronger weight than what people were seeing out in magazines or on television and so forth. So we know that we have the opportunity as parents or close people to young people, um, we have the opportunity to influence them. So the number one question is, what are the messages I'm conveying <laughs> about food and weight? What, how do I handle it when I see, you know, my child heap their plate with bad foods, right? What the world will call bad foods. How do I respond to that? How do I talk about what they weigh or what size they are or how, what I weigh or what size I am? So first parents have to evaluate what are the messages I'm speaking in the home about these things. Chances are, if you're a parent who's caught up in diet culture, you are parroting a lot of what you're hearing. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's bad. Oh, we're going to be bad today and eat this, you know, like that. So you first want to catch, what am I saying? And let's make sure that it's going to not further those problems. Secondly, I think it's always great to be honest and transparent with our children about our own struggles. So let's say you are a parent who is caught up in diet culture right now, like most people. And let's say you have been completely worried about your own weight and you always talk about it at the dinner table and you eat something different than everyone else, right? Then you can begin to think, how can I use this as a lesson for my child to say, you know, mommy's 
really caught up in this and I'm beginning to realize it is stealing from me in this way or that way. And I don't want that for you. You can have that transparent conversation. Doesn't make you a bad parent at all to admit that you don't have all the answers. And then the third thing is just, again, if you see something that's really concerning, you, you do need to go ahead and follow your gut on that and go talk to a professional. You really, even if you have your own issues and you're like, well, I hate to call someone for their issues because I can see that I probably contributed to it. I understand that shame and that fear, but it's still better to go reach out and get that help for your child. And I know women who've done that. They've gotten help for their child. And through that help, they've been able to get help for their own issues. The important thing is we want to step in as soon as we can and be able to reclaim and protect um, years, literally years from being stolen from our kids or from ourselves. Yeah, that is so powerful to think about the messages that each one of us is sending, um, that it's actually more powerful than anything that they're going to see. Um, yeah, yeah, that's all so, so practical and helpful. Um, I've heard from just many different friends who are different ethnicities. They're Korean, they're Chinese, they're, um, they're black, they're Latina, they're, they're even, you know, men of all cultures have talked about how, um, there's, though it just there's some things that are harder to face when you're when you're not the I feel like the majority people that people think of oh eating disorders they think a lot of times of women and they think a lot of times of white women and so but that's not the truth of who's impacted by eating disorders so what do you say to people who are in a situation where they're more of a minority in this space and um, how, how can you encourage them to get some help and kind of challenge some of those gender or cultural uh, messages that might be holding them back from taking the first step to get help? You're so right, Joy. You and I are the poster child. For, no, I was like, right? that's what people think of too late. <laughs> blonde yeah. women, right? Blonde, yeah. white women. Yeah. Although I'm not really blonde. You're I know me either. Really blonde and I am. Um, <laughs> And you're also correct. So there's huge incidences of eating disorders within the Native American population, highly underreported, also within African American, uh, Latino, um, and also Asian cultures. So no one is immune from these issues, but you are correct. There are cultural messages that make it very difficult in different ways. So in the Asian culture, there's a high, high, high priority placed on, on being little and petite. And so their fight is different than in say the Latino culture, where one of the triggers or challenges is that there's a high priority on eating lots of food together as a family, right? And so each culture has different um, things that they have to navigate. When it comes to getting help, I think it's, let's just ask a basic human question, which is, what is my quality of life? And do am I willing to risk, um, you know, breaking that stereotype or somebody disbelieving my issues um, in order to, to do this, I'll say also, also the African-American culture, we did a, a webinar with a gal who you might've met through me, Rachel Hockett. And what I found fascinating about her story was that within her culture, she felt like to deal with something like this was a luxury and we're just trying to get by. Like we, how could we put attention and resources toward counseling when in her mind, her, her people, her culture Sometimes we're just fighting to, you know, just, just to make it through and to get some of the same rights as others, you know? And so, yes, there's multiple factors, but even her, so Rachel, she's so lovely. She reached a point where she realized this is stealing from me and there is more for me out there than this. And so she fought some of that internalized stigma and she went out and got the help that she needed. And today she would say she's so 100% glad she did. And there are, I just say to anyone of any culture, you are not alone. You are not alone in wrestling with these issues, the culture that you are, and you are not alone in feeling like you shouldn't wrestle with these issues. Or if you're male, I mean, more and more males now will admit this, but it used to be, they felt like they couldn't. You're just not alone. This is so, so many people. And so don't let that be your barrier to getting the help you need and living the life that you want to live. Cause you deserve to live that as much as anybody else. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. I think that, um, I think that that is 
it's so beautiful to see the way that you have continued to fight to take the next step. And, and I'd love for you to share a little bit about just like, as you have continued to even pray to be willing to be willing to take the next step or said yes along the way. And that there's so much out there for life and that eating disorders do steal. They, you talked over and over about how it's a thief and it steals so much of the quality of life. And just to be able to share a little bit about what God is doing in your heart and in your life right now and how he's using you and your passions and um, so I would love for you to just kind of share about the ways that, that you're seeing how God is doing that in, in your own life. Yeah. You know, again, turning 50 is kind of a, um, for me, very paradigm shifting, but <clears throat> we talked a little bit before we got on this call today about how, and this was true for me too. Like I felt very defined by my eating disorder. Um, and you know, it was kind of my identity. Now, not everyone feels that way. Uh, but some people do. And then I started a ministry <laughs> to help people with eating disorders. And I ran with that for almost two decades, almost 20 years. Um, and, and it was funny, I, I noticed during those years, you know, there were times when I realized that I had kind of, not intentionally, but switched my identity, you know, from having a food issue to now I'm the, you know, the founder and the runner of this thing. And I'm that girl that stands on stage to help people with food issues. Um, God has done pruning in my life. Like he does for all of us. Hopefully if we're growing, he'll do that. And, um, you know, kind of the twist in my story is that a couple of years ago, you know, this nonprofit, we'd done a lot of really great work and the funding picture was difficult for us. And meanwhile, I was evolving, you know, and we all should be evolving in different ways. And, um, and so a couple of years ago, we actually, this is a very long story short, thought, you know, I got to lay this down. And God led me through a season of truly like Isaac <laughs> laying down this, this ministry. And maybe some of your listeners can relate to laying down something that's a good thing. And God was calling me somewhere different. And at the time we thought this will just die here, you know, and that was a terrible, terrible feeling, but God raised up a lovely, um, younger than me woman who is carrying it forward. And then as I, you know, what, you know, finally let him pry my fingers off of it, which took a number of years. Um, he's led me into a new season and I get to use a lot of the gifts that were instrumental in building finding balance, but I also get to use a lot of the things I learned walking for two decades with people in recovery and my own recovery. And so I get to do like coaching and arts development now for leaders and creatives. And I get to do some really fun things, but what's kind of cool about it. I mentioned way at the top of our conversation, I moved to Nashville to become a Christian recording artist, you know, and that dream didn't happen per se, but what I get to do now is, um, you know, my husband, and I do these soaking and healing worship things together, but all that I learned at finding balance, I get to bring into that environment. And so when I, when we're doing that somewhere, I I'm just so in tune with, you know, the fear and the shame and the loneliness and all the things we've been talking about today. And so I say all that to really encourage the listeners out there, you know, that if, if you're stuck in a struggle and maybe you either think that struggle is defining you in a good way. Like I thought, Oh, you know, I'm so powerful. Cause I'm so thin. It, there was a season when I thought that, or maybe you think it defines you in a bad way. Like I have this struggle, so I can never do anything. Um, th that's just not true. Like God has so much for your life. He's, I love Romans eleven twenty nine. 29, which is the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. He never takes them away. And so you've got so much life to live. Whoever's listening that needs to hear this, you've got so much life to live. God's giving you so much to do. You probably will have different careers and different things that you do in your life. But the important thing is, God, where do you want me today? And if you're the person out there listening and you're feeling struck that he's saying, I want this area, it's holding you back then where he wants you today is really to take that next step and to reach out and to, to admit, you know, that this is holding you back and then to begin to ask him where you should go next. And you just never know what cool things are coming your way. Hard work. Yes. And also cool and fun things. And I'm a list, living testimony of that. And, uh, and I believe that every single one of us can be. So there you go. That's yeah. my little, I love it. I love it. I love seeing the way that, um, you've walked through 
lonely, dark, dark, dark seasons. And um, you've used the way that God has, um, he's shaped you and that it, each step along the way, it's like he used that as you started finding balance, he used that. Um, and now in, in these new steps of what you're doing, and it's, it's cool to see that the way that God has changed you and is changing you and seeing that like your identity is in him and, and he has gifted you to do the good work that you're doing, whether it's, you know, through finding balance, whether it's speaking, whether it's out in the, it's just consulting world. It's, it's, it's incredible. It's incredible to see the way that God is using you and your gifts. And I just, um, I wanted our audience to get to hear that today too, just to see that everybody's story is going to look different, but that taking that next step really, you don't know where it's going to lead. Like you just said, but, but God has good in store for each one of us. And what that can look like is just, we just don't know. We don't know what that's going to be. Um, before we stop today, I would love to just talk a little bit about, you know, we're at a spot where we're getting ready for the holidays and holidays are so often, you know, structured around food. And there are so many different parties and dinners and lunches and get togethers, but almost every get together is going to be built around food in some way or have that as a main element. What are some things that you could um, share with our audience, whether it's somebody who's struggling or a family member of how a family member of somebody who's worried about somebody, um, how, what words of advice can you give as we yeah. enter into the holidays? You, yeah, it is. You're 100% right, Joy. Such a hard, hard time. Maybe the hardest time for most people. Yeah. Um, we have a whole module, by the way, on this in those courses I told you about. So if you go to findingbalance.com slash courses, you guys look for the holiday module. So I'm going to summarize a few things, but you yeah, know, there's we'll put six, that in the chat. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there's six things in there. Uh, six lessons that are very specific. Um, it is really important to be aware of what's going to trigger you. Mm -hmm. And so if you know that when you go to so-and-so's house, they're likely to say such and such to you, or they're likely to stand in a corner and do food behaviors that are triggering to you. You know, so the very first thing is to be aware, be prepared, right. And just kind of check in with yourself. You know, what is it that I'm going to face when I go to um, the workplace? If you're in a workplace, it's actually out of place, you know, with the candy dish, right. Mm -hmm. And with everybody huddled around the candy dish and with the mm -hmm the cakes and the pies and the, the cookies and the things that come in, you know, and being aware of maybe making a list for yourself. What are the things that trigger me? Not that you shouldn't be able to eat any of those things. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying if those things being around trigger you and you just can't stop thinking about them and you, you, you binge on them or it creates other things, that's what I'm talking about. So being aware of what triggers you, whether it's food items or people, um, that's important. Number two, having a person, at least a person to talk to about these things, like don't walk through it alone. You can tell someone you care about. I'm going to so-and-so's house. I'm really nervous because whatever the reason is for you. And could I call you from there if things get hard or can I call you afterward and tell you how it went? You know, don't walk alone. Practice that transparency. Let someone be in your corner. You'll be surprised that people are willing to be in your corner. Um, the third thing is, it's a word that we've used in those courses before, which is resume. Um, I heard that from one of my nutritionist friends, Eileen Stelson Myers. She's like, okay, you get through the really big meal or multiple big meals, you know, during the holidays. And you think, oh my gosh, it's all over. I have to radically restrict to make up for it. And she would just say, resume. Mm -hmm. Okay, we had a busy full day. The next day I'm gonna get up and I'm gonna just resume. It's just next foot forward. This isn't the end of things. Another great thing that's in that series is plan now for where you wanna be January 1st, mm -hmm. okay? I love that. She yeah. calls it Lee Bloom. She calls it future casting. So let me think now about how I want to feel about these things January 1st. Do I want to let it all just like turn into a big, huge mess? And then January 1st, I'm going to start cleaning it up. Or do I want January 1st to be kind of celebrating the fact that I walked through this differently um, than I did the year before? Give yourself props for every bit of progress, you guys. Like don't 
think I have to really, you know, change everything and, and, and walk through this all perfectly, but what would be one way yeah. that you could claim victory that's different than what you've had before? So there's just, there's really so many things. There's boundaries in there. There's being intentional about how you want your Christmas to look, separating yourself from having to do what other people or what you've always done before. What do you want it to look like? I really can't um, advocate enough to actually watch material like that that we have or you know find some material I of course ours I think is the best but find some material <laughs> that's really going to thoughtfully help you have perspective for that because it's just like any if it, would you expect the, the teams going to the Super Bowl to not have like contingency plans on contingency plans for every play that's going to happen they have it right and we need to have the same thing when we're walking into triggering situations so be aware and be prepared and don't walk alone I love that. I love that. I think it's so powerful to see that when we try to do it ourselves or try to hold it all together ourselves, we're not taking advantage of what's possible and that we all need support in different ways. And so what that looks like, and yeah, we'll definitely put the chat in or put the link to the chat um, for the, for the holiday um, programs that you guys have. It's yeah, very helpful. So thank you for sharing, for sharing those things. And um, just as we close today, you know, kind of all the things that you have walked through, all the things you're walking through now, what are what are some of your hopes for the future? What are some of the things that you feel like you're excited to see what God's going to do or things that you hope that he's going to have in store for you? Oh, do you mean for me personally? Yeah, yeah, you oh. personally. And yeah, I mean, you can share for finding balance, the world, other people too, yeah. but just your personal hopes for what God's Sure. Doing. Well, it, I will say it is um, really gratifying to me and such a lesson learned to see that I do think that God is not done with finding balance and he's doing new and greater things. Um, so, so that's exciting to see. And I've tried to be very faithful in stepping out of that um, because it's important. I think when we're handing off something, you know, to be willing to do that. So I've been doing that. And as I've been doing that, he has been opening more doors. I get to do really fun stuff. I am working on producing a couple of shows right now for a Christian media company. Um, I've told you, I love this worship stuff we get to do uh, writing again. Um, I do send out a weekly memo that's sort of about using your voice. So my coaching is true voice. And, uh, so I love the idea of continuing to do that. I feel I had a friend here a week ago who said, you don't seem like you're striving like you used to. And she meant that in a positive way. And I took it that way. Um, I don't feel like I'm striving like I used to. There are still hopes and dreams that I have, but I mostly just want to be true and just be where God wants me to be doing what he wants me to be and helping others to do the same. And so that's through my coaching and consulting and writing and stuff. So I don't know where you'll, where all that will be. Um, I'm more settled in it than ever. And so even just being in that place is pretty gratifying for me at this stage in my life. That's so awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. And um, if it's okay, I'd love to just pray to kind of yeah. close us out today and pray for the people that are joining us. God, um, it is just so beautiful to see the way that you have taken um, every step of Constance's life and um, you've been there with her in the journey and that you're continuing to um, use and grow her to just reach and minister to so many people, God. Um, I just, I thank you for the way that you have carried her through the darkest seasons of um, eating disorder behavior, God, and things that she never even knew could be possible for her life um, are happening now because of the steps that she's taken and the way that she has um, been willing to be willing to take the next step. And um, I just, I thank you for um, answering those prayers for her and for um, the ways that you've shown up in her life and um, the way that she's impacted so many others, God. Um, and I want to pray for each person who's watching, um, whether they're struggling themselves or they're worried about a loved one. God, you know, you know the plans that you have for them and you know the way that you um, you want them to have life and so much abundance in the land of the living God. Um, I pray for anybody who is just not even sure that they feel like there is hope that's possible for them or their loved one. I pray that you will just um, plant in their heart, just even a seed of hope today, God, that you'll see that, um, or that they'll see that, that you are 
their good, loving father, and that um, you're going to walk with them each step of the way. For anybody who's looking for a good counselor or a group to join, um, I pray that you will um, just help them to be able to connect quickly, um, that if they need to start another start with another counselor or try another group, that they'll have the courage to do so, um, and that they'll find some good companions and friends that can walk with them each step of the way. Um, it is a long journey, God, and I pray that you will um, just help each person to know that they're not alone. Um, they've got two sisters right here who, um, who are praying for them and wanting the best for them, and God, I just pray that you will um, help each of us continue to take the next step of what you're asking for us to do and that we'll be willing to um, just say yes to you and whatever whatever you're asking. Um, I pray that each person will just experience more hope and freedom than they ever knew was possible. We trust you, God, and we love you in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. It's been so good to be with you. And I just, I can't wait to see what God is going to continue to do through your life. Thank you, Joy.